Oops, there we go. So we're on. Okay. Thank you, Jones. Uh, Sorry about the technical problems. For, for attending here, and um, it's nice to be back in this um, sort of environment. Of course, I just had a uh, prolonged hand wrestle with these uh, devices here, uh, and it's never, it hasn't gotten any easier, you know. It's funny, uh, the computers were shoved down everybody's throat on the premise that it would be easier, well, or the life of you know, would be more effective or more, but this is uh, like Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. I think it doesn't do such a fantasy. So, anyway, now that I've gotten through that fight, um, this um, uh, this is a presentation is one that I started, uh, it's a kind of a work in progress, and it started uh, for uh, the Open Center in New York, which uh, I know there's some people here from the Open Center, and uh, um, they, uh, they do a, uh, they, for the last number of years, they've done a series of travel programs that they now have uh, packaged into a product called the Quest. Um, and, uh, uh, and they visit places that have uh, various uh, kinds of esoteric significance uh, in um, uh, Western and other uh, uh, histories. And, um, and they're planning a trip to uh, Alexandria uh, in, uh, in Egypt for June. And then there's going to be a, um, they have a big conference, and there'll be a lot of papers delivered, and Ralph has asked me to deliver a paper uh, there. So I'm, so this is the beginning of that paper, and uh, and then there's going to be a trip down the Nile. Uh, there'll be a trip to Cyprus, and there'll be a trip down the Nile. Uh, I'm going to go down the Nile because I never have been. And some of the buildings, you'll see some buildings in here that I've tried to analyze. And one of the sort of the premises of analysis is, for an architect anyway, is that you really have to visit the building if you really want to say anything definitive about it. Uh, you can't really do it from photographs or plans or whatever. You can kind of infer things from that. But if you want to understand the thing, you've got to stand there in it, um, in the sun, in the wind, or whatever, you know, with the view and all that kind of stuff, uh, and the relative sizes of things and everything, and how long it takes to walk from one point to another. So you have all those things. So I've been wanting, this has been on my agenda for many years, so I'm, I'm going to do this, um, uh, this Egypt trip. And so this presentation is kind of... Um, um, it, it's a, it's a lead-in to that trip, and since it's, uh, the thing is focused on Alexandria, um, I, I have always, uh, you know, this is one of the great um, high points of, of the world's intellectual traditions, really, is, is this library at Alexandria. Um, it was started, of course, in about 300 B.C. by the, um, uh, the people who inherited Alexander's empire, particularly the uh, General Ptolemy, who uh, took over Egypt uh, after Alexander's death, and he was inspired by um, <clears throat> um, by uh, the apology, actually, of uh, Socrates. And uh, in the apology of Socrates, um, after Socrates, this is the trial, this is the dialogue about the trial, and after Socrates, of course, is convicted on these ridiculous charges, um, <laughs> which, have, which continue every year in civilized lives, that somebody gets convicted of this kind of stuff. Um, uh, but after he gets convicted, apparently the... Um, uh, the custom at the time in Athens was that the convicted person had to suggest their own punishment. Uh, and this was, an e you know, if, if the guy was a big shot, it was obviously an easy way out. He was to get something easy and they would do it because he was a big shot. You know? um, so Socrates, after they convicted him, Socrates, they, they asked Socrates how he thinks he should be punished. And he says that his punishment should be for, for um, corruption of youth, right? This is what he was convicted of. Um, of course, the, the name is Alcibiades, if anybody knows the story. That's, that's the youth he corrupted. Uh, uh, and um, so, um, so after corruption of youth, it, he says his punishment should be that the state should fund him, you know, set him up as the head of a research institution with, with state funding, uh, and that he should train people to be like him. And there should be a hundred Socrates in, uh, in Athens. He didn't say a hundred, but I mean... So, uh, but this but this idea uh, stuck in the, you know in the, I think in the minds of the culture, and so not that long afterwards, maybe what 150 years or so later, 100 years later, um, you have Ptolemy who says, well, we're going to do it, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to do it, right? And so he um, he sets up the library, what what this institution that later becomes the library, and it more or less takes over the town uh, of Alexandria after a while. It's not a, a building. We tend to think of a library as a building, but actually it was the whole city. It was spread around the whole city. Uh, it was a series of buildings, temples, 
uh, libraries, public buildings, uh, school buildings, probably administrative buildings. It was sort of like a college campus. Uh, I, I tend to imagine it's sort of like NYU in New York or some of these campuses in New York, where they're just part of the city. And you just walk by them, you might not know, uh, but you, if you know, you know, and you see these people. So this is the library in Alexandria. Uh, this obviously, we're on the way in here, and you would pass this thing. This is called the Pharos. This was the tallest building in the ancient world. I think it was like 350 feet or something. Um, or certainly one of them tall. <laughs> Not the tallest thing in the ancient world. Well, maybe the pyramids were taller. I don't know. This was the tallest building that you could actually walk into. The pyramids are solid. You can't walk into it. It's kind of tiny little snaking passageways inside, but they're not really buildings in the conventional sense, they're monuments. Um, so this is the, um, the library, and uh, let's see, uh, can I make this Three, return. Three. Return. There we go, okay, return. So the library itself um, uh, was this series of buildings, actually. This is a reconstruction. This, um, this thing up here is a uh, reconstruction of what one of the principal buildings of the library would have been like. This is an interior view of, of an actual library in Rome, the, uh, the Library of Trajan. It would have been in his farm, I think, in Rome. Uh, and you can see they have these uh, galleries, and the galleries lead off to these rooms, and the rooms would have looked like this kind of thing. They would have been, uh, here they're showing these sort of half or columns or whatever. I'm oh, sorry? Don't, don't press too much. Okay, no, no. You can use your fingertip on um, that pad. Fingertip on the you can use this? Yeah, I, no, I'm not going to be able to control that one. I'm sorry. Um, so anyway, these are little rooms, and you see the scrolls are all stuck in these um, shelves, and we just been room after room with these scrolls, and this was the books. They didn't have books the way we have them, like, they had scrolls. And uh, the policy was, that this was a port city, this was a major trading city, and uh, the policy was that uh, whenever a ship would dock, right, uh, they would go to the captain, and they would ask him if he had any books. These were ships from all over the world. These were ships came from Africa, they came from India, they came from you know, Arabia, and places like this, as well as Northern Europe, and so on. And they would ask me if they had any books. And if you had a book, they would take the book and they would copy it. And by the time the boat left, a week or two later, they would give it back to the guy. Well, I don't know if they always gave it back to him, but uh, at least uh, they got a, at least a copy of it. And so they had hundreds of thousands of these scrolls after not very long a time. Uh, and it was really the wisdom of the world. And the tragedy is, we don't... Um, out of hundreds of thousands of scrolls, I mean, I think there might have been like a thousand or so that, that we actually know about. But, I mean, it was such a huge amount of stuff um, that it, it is just totally uh, tragic. You know, that, Return. That we don't know. Return. Okay. Now, of course, when, when you discuss libraries or library interior, um, <laughs> you, have to, you have to talk about Borges a little bit, you know, because this is the ultimate library. This is, <laughs> this is you know, Cosmos as library, a library as Cosmos. And uh, these are two envisionments um, uh, from that famous uh, short story about the library, and the story, for those who may not know it, but one or two people who may not know it, I'm sure most of everybody's read it, but um, it's, the, it's this metaphor that um, the cosmos is a library that goes on endlessly, and these galleries, that's what's in these drawings, the galleries go on endlessly, and the books are written in a language that nobody knows how to read, right? And the human race is just wandering around through the galleries, right? And he goes, and Borges is just wonderful in this, I won't belabor it, but he says, you know, occasionally somebody thinks they've doped out a sentence, right? And they write papers about how, what this means and everything, and then somebody contradicts them, and or somebody finds something else, and they contradict them, and, and it all is for naught, and they just wander into another gallery, and people just go on and on. And it'll never end, it'll clearly never end. But really, if you think about it, it's a very good metaphor for what we're confronting. We're looking at the kind of the book of nature, right, uh, in a certain way, or the Western project is to look at this book of nature uh, that's written in a language that we can't really read and we have to try to dope it out, and people think they found little parts of it at various times, and then it turns out that that's not really correct, and some other story comes in, and we'll see this, I think, in a minute. Now, the, um, over a period, the library lasted for, I think, 1,100 years, something like that, 1,150 years, or something like that, close to... That, that figure. Uh, it starts around 300 or 330 or something AD or 300 AD, and it's not closed until about 450. Right? BC to AD. BC to AD, right. BC to AD. So it's, uh, what, 300 years plus 400, so it's like 700. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't get 1,000. So 700 years. Uh, but that's a pretty long time. And in that 700 years, there were a lot of phases that went through. The first phase of it is uh, Euclid. Euclid, this is from the School of Athens. This is Euclid here. And he's demonstrating something in, on a chalkboard there on the floor. 
uh, I think it's a musical scale or some, I don't remember what it is in the painting. I can't, they know what it is then, actually. And again, this plugs into, this is one of the great paintings, well, it's the School of Athens, I don't have it here, but this is one of the great paintings um, that embodies some of these ideas that uh, Julianne was talking about. Uh, you have uh, the great uh, philosophers or whatever, all in this big hall, this big monumental hall, and they're all sort of doing their thing. Um, but then, uh, but so he's early. So uh, first you have Euclid. Euclid is, is actually appointed by Ptolemy, supposedly, the, uh, the founder. And he's around 300 AD, or shortly after um, um, the, the founding of it. He's supposed to be one of the first heads of it. Um, and he makes, uh, he, his book, they, he writes several books, but the one that's sort of the all-time uh, classic, of course, is The Elements of Geometry. And the elements of geometry, he wrote it about 300 B.C., or 250 B.C., 280 B.C., something like that. And it was, it was used as a textbook right up, you know, into the early 20th century, um, before, like, modern education trashed it or whatever, you know. Um, they actually used to uh, teach from this book. Um, and so this was, it was a tremendous synthetic work, and it's a work of what I would call towering lucidity, right? This is Euclid's mm -hmm. Elements. It, it is one of the most incredibly, incredibly frighteningly lucid things. I mean, you just, it's almost terrifying how powerful it is. It's just in these simple phrases and sentences and step by step, you know, in the production. Um, and of course, it's taken as a work of kind of Aristotelian uh, clarity and purity and externalness or whatever. But if you read Proclus, right, particularly Proclus, and if, but even Nicomachus, um, the Amblicus, you know, uh, Plotinus in his own way, right, all these guys, um, they're revealing, and again, particularly Proclus, who says it literally, uh, they're revealing that there's a kind of Platonic, I don't want to say underside, to me the image is that uh, if the, the library is kind of like a giant cake, or the intellectual content of the library is kind of like a giant cake, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a kind of Aristotelian icing. There's like a 16th of an inch of Aristotelianism around the outside of this cake. And the cake is Plato. I mean, <laughs> like, that's the relationship to me between these guys, you know. And so one of the, the, the goals of this presentation uh, is to scrape off that uh, 16th of an inch of, of Aristotelianism that we all have been that we've all had pointed out to us very forcefully, and the giant cake that's underneath, of course, is never mentioned. Um, and it was interesting that um, in um, uh, Julianne's discussion about the Renaissance, um, uh, and she talks about uh, 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 Cosmo and uh, Ficino, you know, appointing Ficino, but it was, um, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Platon, uh, uh, to Mrs. Platon, all right, Platon, who actually brings Plato to that conference in Florence in 1432 or whatever it was, a few years before the fall. Um, they have this big conference, and, and Platon comes over as part of the delegation, and he's called Platon because he's a Platonist. Now, the, the point is that in, in the Middle Ages, which is the period that precedes this, it was pretty much illegal to read in Greek. Or it kind of wasn't illegal technically, but if you could read in Greek, uh, people were kind of scared of you. The other monks wouldn't talk to you, or they would, um, you could be charged with something, you know, with like heresy or something. Uh, it was difficult. It was, it was a problematic thing to read in Greek and uh, during the Middle Ages. And so, um, and of course, Aristotle had been translated early on, but the Platonic translations were very spotty. There were only a few fragments, and... Um, a lot of it was not known to, to non-Greek uh, readers. Um, and so Aristotle had a lot of credibility because of Aquinas mostly, and um, Plato was uh, kind of shady stuff. I mean, it wasn't stuff that you'd want to have on your resume that, that you were involved in. Um, and Plethon turned that around in these lectures. And the lectures were attended by a lot of people, and it turns out that two of the most important architects of the Renaissance, Bruno Lecce and Alberti, both attended these lectures by Plethon, right, along with Cosmo. Right? I don't know if Ficino actually attended, but, um, uh, but they're all, uh, uh, apparently many of the leading intellectuals attended. So anyway, th that's sort of um, uh, some of the history about Platonism, but, uh, or, or about this role of the library. 
Uh, later on, you get um, you, you get Eratosthenes, who who is this? I don't. That doesn't. You know, that's just a drawing of a person that somebody calls Eratosthenes. I mean, nobody knows what these guys actually look like. We have very many. Other. So these are all just fanciful things, especially of course uh, Raphael did a beautiful job. But uh, uh, but this is Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes is quite interesting. He's already in a second phase. Okay, he's like. Um, you know, 100 years later, or almost 75, or 100 years, you know, a couple generations later after uh, Euclid, and he's already using the techniques that Euclid has provided. He's already using the groundwork that Euclid has provided. And you get to Ptolemy, who already is in the Christian era, he's two or three hundred years later, and he's kind of a systematizer, right? They're not doing anything new anymore. Euclid did something new, right? That the elements was a synthesis. Um, Eratosthenes uses the synthesis and. Um, What's his name? Archimedes, as well as I think a contemporary of Eratosthenes, and also uses uh, Euclidean work as the basis for his stuff. But Ptolemy already is summing up; he's not doing any new research. Right? So there's these phases. You have, you have the creative phase, and and then you have this sort of a working phase, and then you have a kind of a summing up phase right, of the library. So let's see where we go. Now, what I want to do is look at some things by Euclid, and most of this will be about Euclid, but. Um, uh, but, but basically, it, it's to take some of these things. Now, this is, oh, people can read it. I think you can actually read these things. People, um, th th these are drawings of uh, Euclid's Proposition 1. This thing is Euclid's, well, these are actually three propositions. These two represent three propositions by Euclid. Um, and this is, um, where is it, Magda? I don't know if Magda is still here. She has, uh, oh, she's there. You know, Magda. But these are some of the diagrams. You'll see some of these things are the same diagrams that Magda used in her uh, uh, you know, paintings. Uh, to uh, set them up, um, and and so th these things again. This is extreme lucidity, or you know, lucidity in the extreme. Um, in proposition one, uh, well, proposition one actually is the triangle, okay, and it starts with this figure called the Vesica Pisces, as we heard, and you have the the, uh, the triangle forms naturally within it, right? But the Vesica Pisces is quite a remarkable thing, actually, and it also has uh, a number of other properties that Euclid uses in these other propositions which are to uh, divide a line, because if you take the, um, uh, the short line between the two centers and the long line, they will mutually bisect each other. Right? And, um, and not only will they mutually bisect, but they mutually bisect at right angles. So the vesicle Pisces is a seminal construction. Right? It's a very important construction.